Good morning. The Committee on General Government Operations and Federal Foreign and Regional Affairs now convenes this hearing. For the record, today is August 4th, 2017, and the time is now 10.33 a.m. In accordance with the Open Government Law, public notices for, for today's proceedings were provided to senators, stakeholders, and lo our local media. A five-day notice was provided on Thursday, July 27th, 2017, and a 48-hour notice was provided on Wednesday, August 2nd, 2017. The Committee on General Government Operations and Federal, Foreign, and Regional Affairs will hear and accept testimony, both oral and written, on the following items. Uh, please bear with me for item number one. It has quite a long title. Bill number 45-34, COR, as corrected by the prime sponsor, introduced by Senator Joe S. San Augustine. An act to repeal section 1107 of chapter 1 relative to deleting the definition of primary from the elections law. To repeal sections 3102C1, 3102C2, and 3102C3 of chapter 3 relative to 17-year-olds voting in primaries to repeal Section 3107B of Chapter 3 relative to the prohibition of flying voters between the primary and general elections, to repeal Chapter 15 in its entirety relative to the conduct of primary elections, to amend Sections 17101G of Chapter 17 relative to deleting the definition of primary from the election campaign contributions and expenditures law, to amend sections 17113A and B of Chapter 17 relative to deletion of primary from aggregate contributions regarding election campaign contributions and expenditures law. To amend sections 17116 of Chapter 17 relative to deletion of primary from primary reports regarding election campaign contributions and expenditures law. To repeal sections 17118A of Chapter 17 relative to repeal of primary from final and supplemental reports regarding election campaign contributions and expenditures law. To amend sections 17118B of Chapter 17 relative to amendment to indicate material to be reported in final and supplemental reports regarding election campaign contributions and expenditures law and to amend sections 2109 of chapter 2 title 4 guam code annotated relative to removing reference to primary in prohibition on hiring after an incumbent loses an election all sections of title 3 guam code annotated and relative to removing the primary election that's just the first bill <laughs> the second bill we have on the agenda is bill number 111-34 introduced by senator tom c Ada. An act to amend sections 51A 117 and to add a new sections 51A 118, 51A 119, and 51A 120, and sections 51A 121 to chapter 51A, both of Title 10, Guam Code annotated, and to amend sections 4403F of Article 4, Chapter 4 of Title 4, Guam Code annotated, and to add sections 5117A to Chapter 5 of Title 5, Guam Code annotated, relative to the transition of the Guam Solid Waste Authority out of receivership. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues present with me this morning. Uh, to uh, my far right is our uh, co-chair of the committee, our vice chair, Senator Mary Torres. To her immediate left is our vice speaker, Therese Terlahi. To her immediate left is Senator Tom Adam. Thank you for joining me. To my immediate left is Senator Joseph Augustine, and to his immediate left is uh, Senator Frank Ogden, Jr. Colleagues, thank you for joining us this morning. We'll go ahead and begin uh, with Bill number 45-34, <clears throat> and I'd uh, like to yield at this time to the prime sponsor for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill 45 that you have in your hand, my colleagues, and to the, and to the public, there's, um, I'll be working with the committee to add, to make amendments to that, to this bill, because this bill as submitted, corrected by the primes, by myself, only addresses the primary. Um, we find that the conducted primary election paid for by the public through the appropriation made to the Guam Election Commission and the use of regular government employees is an expensive exercise when generally only one or two individuals are eliminated from being candidates in the engaging, ensuing general election. It, be, it would be a cost-saving measure both to the government and to individual candidates running for office if the primary was eliminated. Additionally, if there are multiple candidates for office where there's only one position available, the elimination of the primary would most closely resemble the will of the people in choosing an individual to occupy the available position. That would be my opening, uh, Mr. Chairman, in reference to the 
corrected by prime sponsor, but I will be submitting you uh, an amendment that would add the the other um, items on the on the election reform that that addresses from the mayors to the unclassified employees and such, and be asking for a follow-up hearing, sir. Thank you, Senator San Augustine. So, pursuant to what you're saying, we will be. Um, awaiting whatever amendments you're going to transmit. Yes. And if necessary, also pursuant to our standing rules, if they do materially affect the bill, we will be having the uh, measure reheard. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, however, we are um, convened for Bill 45 as corrected, and so we do have a number of individuals who have signed up to testify. I'll go ahead and entertain the, the testimony. We do have a number in favor and some not in favor, and so what I would like to do is um, uh, combine those who are in favor and those who are not in favor into two separate groups so that we have some consistency in the, uh, in the messaging. Uh, first, we'll have those who have signed up in favor <clears throat> and have also indicated that they have oral testimony. In favor, uh, as indicated, we have um, Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero. You can please join us, sir. We also have Mr. Daryl Taggarty, who has signed up in favor. He's on his way. We also have a number of individuals who have indicated they are in favor, but they have not indicated that they will be providing testimony. Uh, the, the committee report will reflect your names and your uh, support for the measure. Mr. Dungar, you may begin at any time. My name is Ken Leon Guerrero. I represent the Guam Citizens for Public Accountability. I'm here to testify in favor of Bill 45. I think that Bill 45 is a good first step to making our elected proce election process more responsive to the people. Because the first function of the current primary process is to select candidates to represent the Republican and the Democratic Party. I do not see how that is a function of the government to select who is going to represent a party in an election. And especially when you take a look at the information provided to me by the Guam Election Commission, going into the 2016 election, 5% of registered voters indicated a, a uh, Democratic preference, 4% of the voters indicated a Republican presidency. I do not believe a 9%, having 9% of the population indicate a political party reference, preference is a mandate that the government fund an election designed solely to determine who will represent the Republican and the Democratic parties in the election. The government's only organic obligation is to provide for an election, a general election, every two years. As the current primary process stands right now, the second function of the process is to allow the uh, political parties to control the candidate selection process. So before you can get any support from a political party, you have to pay your dues, so to speak, and prove yourself a worthy candidate as far as non-elected members of the political parties are concerned. In other words, the public at large doesn't select who the party bosses are. That is solely a party function. Yet to have the party bosses be in charge of screening and appointing or anointing candidates to run for office, I think that does the public a disservice. Many people who want to run for office won't run for office because they know they can't pass the litmus test of whether or not they will be blessed or welcomed with open arms into the political party. And I'm, I'm probably one that wouldn't be welcomed into either one of them. Uh, the third function of the primary election is to give political party bosses a stick to control their candidates. And as we saw in the 2016 election, when the chairman, Mr. Senator St. Nicholas, refused to sign the Democratic uh, Party loyalty pledge, there was a lot of talk and threats in the media that uh, the party would probably decertify him as a member of the Democratic 
party, thereby stripping him of his uh, election win. Now, fortunately, wiser heads prevailed and uh, didn't do that. But the mere fact that they could have is another reason why the primary party system, as is, is dysfunctional and needs to end. Because how do we give backroom party bosses the power to decide who should represent us, the citizens, in the legislature? The fourth function of the primary election is to double the fundraising opportunities. You have two elections, you have two fundraising opportunities. I've done rather extensive research into the fundraising patterns over the last four election cycles, and it came as no surprise to me that incumbents raise a majority of their uh, re-election fund in the primary, and the newcomers who survived the beauty contest, so to speak, raise a majority of their funds after they've survived the primary. So the primary election serves as another barrier to open competition among the best ideas to represent the people of Guam. As far as I'm concerned, there are five reasons to support Bill 45. The first reason, eliminating the primary, throws the election, the general election process wide open and encourages the widest possible uh, selection of potential candidates to run for office. So the public will get to hear many different points of view about government policy as opposed to carefully screened, carefully filtered, and carefully spoon-fed uh, policies as dictated by the different parties. The second reason for eliminating the primary is to crank up the intensity of the election process because going up to the primary, all we have is a beauty contest. We don't have a true clash of ideas. We don't have true discourse. What we have is a bunch of photo opportunities and handshake and meet the candidate debates, but nobody really says anything of substance until after the primary because they're trying to keep their powder dry for the race that matters. Eliminating the primary, all candidates from the word go will be forced to put their best ideas out for open discussion among the public and may the best idea win, as opposed to the way the system is right now, uh, who throws the biggest party win. The fourth reason to eliminate the primary election is financial, both from a taxpayer point of view and from a candidate point of view, because the campaign funds are raised from, oddly enough, taxpayers. Two elections means that taxpayers are hit twice for the opportunity to, so, to um, support the candidate of their choice. And this is really uh, a burden for businesses because businesses feel an obligation to donate for fear of not backing the right horse could affect their business down the road. So by eliminating the primary contest, all donors will be required to hedge, uh, place their bets at the first roll of the dice and not wait till another hand is, comes around. And also in the line of uh, financial, the last four election cycles, taxpayers have spent nearly $1.6 million running the beauty contest. And in that entire time, four election cycles, here at the legislature level, we've eliminated a total of 14 people in uh, four election cycles. So it would have been cheaper for taxpayers to give $100,000 to people not to run, and taxpayers would have been money ahead. So by eliminating the primary election, funded by taxpayers, we create a more open race with more potential candidates able to enter. We see a more vigorous discourse on ideas rather than party blather. And I hate to say it, but you know, I, because of what I'm doing, I pay close, careful attention to the campaign ads. And that's basically from my perspective, you take, there's one canned campaign ad. And no offense, but you all run it. Things are bad, elect me, things will get better. Our schools will get better, our Mononco will be better treated, we'll fix GMH 
and will solve all the problems of government in Guam. But there's no detail, there's no description, there's no actual explanation how you will do these things. But by eliminating the primary, the public will be more interested in hearing how elected officials plan to do what they propose to do, which we are more concerned in than what you propose to do, because you all propose to do the same thing. Uh, the fifth reason this bill is in the best interest of voters and probably the thing that I very, very uh, liked a lot was in addition to the police court cl police clearance and the court clearance, it requires district court clearance and clearance from revenue tax. And I hate to say it, but the trust in public officials has gotten to that point. And as we have seen the last couple of months in the news cycles, as a number of appointed uh, officials have gone on a parade through the media for various questionable uh, operations, transactions, decision-making processes. I think this added layer of security, because if you're going to be paid for by taxpayer dollars, it would be nice for the public to be assured that you at least are paying your fair share. The election of 2016 proved that voters are demanding a more transparent election process and eliminating the primary through Bill 45 is a very good first step in creating a more transparent and a more vigorous election process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lunguero. Do any of my colleagues have any questions for the individual of this panel? If none, um, I, I just wanted to make a comment, Mr. Lunguero. Um, in the last election, the beauty contest, as you so referred, uh, Senator Uggen came in number one, so he is the most handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and you were second. <laughs> I was second. I'm coming, I'm coming for you. Your modesty, your, your modesty uh, <laughs> becomes you. <laughs> Vice Speaker Tulahi. Thank you. Um, you said that the candidates el eliminated in the last three primary elections, there were 14? 14, 14 you, at the yeah, senatorial level. How do you calculate level. that? The, the statistics you give us, Two, four in 2016, one? I mean, does that up to 14 or is there something else? Something no. In, uh, I think it was 2012, we eliminated one candidate. Another election, we eliminated one candidate. Uh, yeah, the 2012 and the 2014 primary, we eliminated one candidate. Uh, the 2010 pri primary, we eliminated eight candidates. The 2016 primary, we eliminated four candidates. All right. And your estimated cost is for three years. That's what your the one million six hundred. That's for the four years four for years. the four election cycles. All right. Okay. Thank you. And I took that from the budget appropriations request, and then cut it in half because half the operation is for the general, half is for uh, administrative operations for each year, is the way I looked at it. Would, would your opinion change if there were like a, a really large number of candidates? No. When we look at the countries around the world, they, they have democracies where large numbers of candidates run and uh, they've been able to deal with those situations. So I see no reason. I mean, in, if, let's take a hypothetical situation here. In Guam, let's say we have 35 people run for office, 40 people, 50 people run for office. How is that going to be any different than having 30 people run for office. So it all becomes a numbers game at that point. And whoever has the best message, whoever has the best messaging capability will rise to the top of that. And we only have to look at the presidential election where even a bad message well delivered will rise to the top and gain the attention of voters. But it's a good example of a bad example of the fact that it changed, it required uh, political candidates to engage in dialogue of ideas. Only one candidate did, the others didn't. Everybody else kept holding on to the f fact that they were gonna, he was going to flame out. 
run out of things to say, and when he didn't run out of things to say, they never got into the race because they wouldn't say anything. You know, other than, you know, the political party, the, do the Democratic Party is strong, we have vibrant ideas. Build a wall, you see. I'm not saying it was an ideal outcome, but I'm saying that having more candidates with one shot at getting elected, we will see specific ideas come out and compete for voter attention sooner than we do in the current process. What about the 50 plus one requirement, particularly in gubernatorial races, do you think there would be an impact? Well, we got five teams running. Mm -hmm. And if any of those teams are worth their salt, they should be able to generate a 50% uh, dominance. And if they can't demonstrate a 50% dominance in the voting marketplace, then there's problems with what they're saying, there's problems with how they're delivering the message. And if we have to do a runoff election between the top two vote getters in 30 days, the cost of that will still not be anywhere near the cost of uh, running a primary operation because all the infrastructure is in place, all the people are in place, everything's queued up, and the money has already been collected. There's not going to be enough time between the, the general election and the runoff to have any fundraising that will be able to change the outcome at that point. So it's going to be a, mat a battle of ideas. Who has the best ideas? Now, if we get to a situation where we have three people and all three are, you know, like within five or six points apart and we select the two top to run, then we should not have a problem getting a clear winner out of that. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Dungaro? Uh, Mr. Tigerty, we're going by order of um, indication of where they uh, stand on the issue, and it has been indicated when you signed up that you are also in favor and that you have oral testimony to present. Please join us. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I will, uh, I'd like to read my testimony into the record and then make some other comments as we go along. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for soliciting the viewpoint of the public regarding Bill 45-34. Uh, I also thank uh, Senator St. Augustine for, pros for proposing this policy change to conserve public funds. Political subdivisions adopted public funding of primary elections in earnest after 1968 when Americans became fed up with candidate selection by special interest deal makers and party bosses. Conventions and caucuses provided window dressing for smoke-filled back rooms where politician careers were made and ended. The major parties needed the integrity of public balloting. Primaries in full public view improved the image of political parties and boosted donations and grassroots participation and government picked up the bill. What does the public get out of an orderly primary election? How does it benefit the major, major parties? In 2013, when I was acting state party chairman of the Democratic Party, village level representatives discussed closing Guam's currently open primaries. We were concerned that candidates used our party for its advocacy and campaign organization without any obligation afterwards to a common agenda or platform or even each other. The party is a private association organized to promote the interest of its members, not the interest of the general public. It performs no public function. Why should the parties throw open their internal candidate selection process to non-members? Some would argue that more people participate in open primaries. Does a boost in numbers justify such a major public expense? Similarly, if the parties insisted that the primary balloting be restricted to only registered members, would the government pay for it? Clearly, there is little public benefit or service provided by the primary ballot exercise. Is it true that the government spends more on one primary election alone 
than the major political parties spend on all their meetings, signature galas, and campaign advertising activities over two years combined. One might argue that reconciliation of competing factions is promoted when rejection is spread out over less connected voters. Precinct workers appreciate the extra earnings. Where is the compelling public interest in conducting and funding a primary election? Political parties should exhibit integrity in their candidate selection process instead of relying on a government agency and funds to stay clean. Essentially, funding the primary election is a budgeted gift by elected officials to the parties and hundreds of precinct workers who administer it. Will the current senators vote on Bill 45-34 in the public interest or to benefit party, candidate, and precinct worker interests? What is to be gained if the primary is eliminated besides saving hundreds of thousands of dollars? I expect a stronger sense of purpose by party leaders and active members as candidates seek party support in addition to general campaigning. The Democratic and Republican parties will cease to be a rather meaningless backdrop for successful candidates. Please vote to pass Bill No. 4534 in committee and during session. Perhaps you will discover other funded activities of the government that lack public purpose or substantive public benefit and should be eliminated. Thank you for considering my perspectives. Sincerely. And Mr. Taggart, you indicated that you had some additional oral um, statements you wanted to add on top of your written statement. Yes, I, it is uh, my observation and opinion, not representing the party at this point, but my opinion from having been an active party member since here on Guam since uh, 1982, that um, the party itself needs to be stronger internally and play a stronger role to uh, differentiate themselves and, and also to um, discipline the members, the individual members who are elected so that there is a clear agenda moving forward that is presented to the people. And the primary election waters this down, allows candidates to go around the party and it's, it's in the interest of parties to eliminate the, the primary election. In my opinion, it would strengthen the party system. Now, you'd think that, that we want to get special interests, like, like the movers and shakers of the party, out of the process. It's only a government process because of the, party, uh, because of the primary law. Otherwise, it's supposed to be an association process, the freedom of association. Members of the Democratic Party don't expect people who are not members of the Democratic Party to make their decisions for them. But that's what's happening now because the primary is publicly funded. Active party members want to exert discipline and influence over their representatives, the ones who say they are Democrats, the ones who say they are Republicans. There should be a, 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 the powers that exist in our bylaws for sanction, and an agenda and coming to consensus and the processes are all there. They're in our, in our Constitution and bylaws, but because of the primary election law, those are all bypassed. It's a, it's a huge hypocrisy. And the candidates rely on the party and the party cannot rely on the candidates. And so the organization, the party organization, cannot exert influence. So where, is it, where are these people exerting influence? They're exerting influence directly on you, in office. And we need to separate this out. It should be a party function, and it should not be in the halls of government office agencies and, and institutions during your elected terms except through, clearly, party interest, which is stated up front and said, this is our agenda moving forward. I think our systems will be better served without a primary election, in my opinion. And I thank you for 
um, hearing my thoughts on this. Thank you. I'm just, I, I'm, I just have a couple questions now because I'm trying to reconcile the two testimonies. Um, both are here testifying in favor of, the, um, of removing the primary election, uh, but Mr. Leon Guerrero's testimony is in favor of removing it to somewhat dilute the influence of party uh, in primary elections, and Mr. Taggarty is in favor of it to enhance the influence in party elections. And so, gentlemen, if you can pr probably help me reconcile uh, how that is a, a disconnect in, in, in both testimonies. What happens in the party stays in the party. It shouldn't spill over to the primary election. If the Democratic Party wants to hold um, a caucus at the field house or at a hotel, and all the Democrats come together, Democrats come together and decide who we are going to support in this campaign. That's not a conflict between what I'm saying and what he's saying. What I'm saying is that I shouldn't be forced to go kneel and kiss the ring of a Republican Party boss or a Democratic Party boss if I ever hope to have a chance at running for office. If I run for office without the support of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, I can choose to run as an independent because there is no primary election. Because in order to get into the general, you have to run and win in a primary. And then, you know, that whole independent thing comes in and becomes a mess and becomes ugly. I mean, how can an independent win in a party race? So we take out this equation. If the Democratic Party says, these are the 27 people we feel represent the interests of the Democratic Party, fine. Let them run in the general election against the 29 people that the Republicans think are good, represent the interests of the Republican Party. Fine against the 15 or 20 people who think we stand a chance representing, you know, uh, ordinary citizens like us. So I don't see a conflict between what he says and what I'm saying. He's saying that taking the pri eliminating the primary will s strengthen the political parties by forcing them to groom and, you know, their candidates, train, and, and that's fine. That is, I have no problem with the parties doing what they want to do outside of the election process. It's just that membership in a party should not be a requirement to run in the general election. Approval by a party should not be a requirement to run in the general election. Now, what he's saying is that, uh, what I think he's saying, is that if the party strengthens itself and comes up with a message and they find a group of people that are willing to carry that message as representatives of the Democratic Party, that doesn't, that doesn't contaminate the general election. Whereas right now, in order to get into the general election, you have to be blessed, if you will, by the party bosses to be able to run as a Republican or a Democratic candidate. That's where what he said is right and what I'm saying is right, because he's talking about if we take away the government-funded primary, which allows candidates to bypass, to run and say they're Republicans or say they're Democrats, regardless of whether the party says they're Republicans or Democrats, or I may be getting it messed up because of what happened to you at the end of 2016. But the whole point is, the political party influence should end at the, at the general election voting line. And it should not be a screen or a litmus test to be able to get into the general election. I'm, the reason why I'm asking is because I don't recall reading anywhere in the statute anything that would um, cause the election commission to limit the candidates on the general election that would be created in this statute to only those that have cleared a party primary. So I think that anybody, based on how this is written, could still go and register as a particular party without requiring any kind of um, uh, party election. There's no party election in the statute. There um, are, there is a recognition of the roles of the political parties. There is also a, a um, proportional requirement that, that independent candidates to appear on the general election ballot have to have a certain number of votes. Um, 
in relation to those cast for members of the two major political parties. However, if you, if you wish to vote in the primary, you only get to vote for one of the parties or an independent. You don't get to vote across the lines. Right. So um, as, as the activities of the parties is uh, dominant, the threshold for independent candidates is very high. And it's in the law. Right. Current, you have to current. get so many, so much of a percentage of those votes cast for candidates of the major parties. It's a very high threshold to expect people in the, the public to vote, the public generally, to vote for uh, independent candidates and, and not for any of the candidates on the Republican or, or uh, Democrat ballots, sides of the ballot. And so that's a high, a very high threshold which is created by the primary law. Right. But it is, when you look at the, at the qualifications for, for being on the general election ballot, it's, it's a mirror of the, pri it's, the primary is a mirror of the general. Right. So it's that additional layer. And it only benefits the, primary, uh, the political parties at government expense. Right. But it also is a detriment to the political parties because it introduces, because it's an open primary. If the party were, if the primaries were closed to only those who declared to the election commission that they, that they will vote on the Democrat or Republican side of the ballots before, as, when they go in to register. Not because the party gives them a, a set of um, roles and say here, administer our roles, but only people who ask, who register to vote as a partisan, um, uh, in a partisan uh, primary, then what you would have is you may find that that independents are 60 or 70 percent of the total voting electorate, and the parties are only uh, representing 15 percent at all. And then that would be a different form of skew, which is why we haven't been discussing it for years. But so it's the same. It's the same problem. The government is is conducting a primary and saying how the, these two associations are going to participate and interferes with the, with the freedom of association of the two organizations. So I, I just want to clarify, just so that there's no confusion, what, what Bill 45 will do is it will eliminate the primary and it will also basically um, allow for anybody to vote for whoever they want regardless of party in a single election. There is nothing in here that creates a filter or a requirement for somebody to have passed a party election first. Um, there's nothing in here that's going to create any kind of threshold for anyone to be able to register as a Democrat or a Republican. So um, you're, I, I, don't, I don't want to clarify that because you're, you're, I think you're testifying to the idea that a party primary would be appropriate, but this, this would in no way create that mandate. And so I just wanted to clarify that because that... That's um, right. That's right. There is... I'm not asking that, that this uh, bill be modified to have a closed primary. I'm just using the, the concept of, the, clo of the, the closed versus open primary to show the, the detriment to the whole, the whole process, especially to the, the political process of the two major parties that we have an open primary on the government of Guam law. That is how we conduct our, our elections now. And by eliminating that, it strengthens the role of the parties. It, it puts the government emphasis on having a vote that really matters, which is to select, for the public to select its, its um, officials for the next term. It cleans everything up by eliminating the government-funded primary. The, the parties can can field their can, their field of candidate can field a set of candidates that they endorse by their internal processes, and and uh, persons who are who do not get the party endorsement don't seek the party endorsement can approach the public directly. But there's nothing in here that would pro prohibit those people who do not get that endorsement from still going and registering as that, under that political party for that general election. When you eliminate the primary, the parties become advocates and individuals or groups of individuals can also approach the public directly. Right. 
That's it, for, in the general election, That's correct. which is the way the law originally was. The primary is just a, a, a it's a pre-general election with the same process. That's but, how it's written in the law. But, but, limited, but it limits the voters' uh, ability to select to only a single party um, uh, component in the primary. Yes, and it also um, uh, interferes with the freedom of association of the members of the two political parties. Understood. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify for, um, yeah. just on, on how, what the bill is actually going to be doing. Oh, okay. Um, an anecdotal story to that effect. In the 2012 election, the only candidate eliminated was Mo Cotton. And the problem that affected Mo Cotton was that so many of his supporters were also Madeline supporters. And so as a result, their votes were wasted because they voted on both sides of the ballot. So we have that confusion as well. We, it'd be interesting to ask the Election Commission how many, I know it's in her report because her reports are so comprehensive, but I didn't think to look at that factor right there in preparing for today. But it goes back to when I lived in Hawaii and in the 70s, the primary process was a closed shop. You went in and they checked your name. If you were registered as a Democrat, you got to get a Democrat vote. If you were registered as a Republican, they gave you a Re Republican ballot. And there were like five other parties in Hawaii at the time you know, the Restore the Monarchy Party, and, you know, there were a lot of other, and so, but if you were a registered member of those parties, you would, they would check you on the printout, and then you would get the ballot for that party only, uh, which we don't do here because we're running an open primary, so the taxpayers will fund it. But the other aspect that I find challenging as a voter here is that, when we look at the voter apathy at the primary, we have a very large drop-off from the general to the next primary, with the exception of the 2016, we had a big uh, increase. But normally, we have a drop-off after the general, and by the time the next primary comes around, we see like maybe, uh, I think the last one, we went from like 47 and 24, general to 41 or 39 in the primary for 2016. You know, because so many people, they, they just don't, they don't participate in the primary. They want, they, want to, they want the real thing. And I think we are shortchanging our community with that, that interim step because so many candidates can't run because of the, the challenges of the primary, the fundraising, competing against incumbents for funds, things like that. Um, but I think that donors would be more open to listening to new, f new opinions when they only get one chance to vote, uh, one chance to place their bets, pardon me, as opposed to now they wait to see who survives the beauty contest and then they pay place their bets. Do any of my colleagues have any other questions for the panel? If none, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and testimony. Thank you. Uh, next um, signed up, we have those who are in opposition of Bill 45. I have um, signed up uh, Mr. Kin Paris. Uh, please join us, sir. Uh, Mr. Victor Cruz, sir. And uh, Senator Bob Klitsky. Any of you gentlemen care to defer to any other for to begin? Senator Bob. I guess it's the age before beauty. Going back to the beauty contest. I didn't realize that the primary election was a beauty contest. I couldn't figure out why I ran why I won up until now, but anyhow. <laughs> Honorable Chairman San Nicholas and uh, members of the committee. Three reference points are essential in the examination of this bill. 
Democrats, Republicans, governor. As we sit here today, three or maybe four Democrats have thrown their hats into the ring while only one Republican has come forward. If this bill were to become law, only compliance with three GCA, section 17106 and following, plus three GCA, sections 6108 and 6110 would be required. Thus, any of the candidates need only file a few papers and a declaration in order for his or her name to appear on the general election ballot as a gubernatorial candidate. Without the winnowing process provided by a primary, it's possible that the Democrat vote could be split four ways, guaranteeing at least inclusion in the runoff required by the Organic Act, if not an outright victory for Ray Tenorio. Since the usual threshold requirements to candidacy, for instance, petitions, a primary election, and partisan involvement would be absent, the potential for mischief, manipulation, and mistake is manifest. In contrast to the highly partisan nature of the general election, Sands primary described above, the general election ballot would not even identify candidates by party. In short, the passage of 32 pages of Bill 45 would turn the essential feature of our democracy into a free-for-all. The Bill 45 free-for-all is justified in its section one as, quote, a cost-saving measure. There are no doubt cheaper forms of government. One is reminded of the famous Winston Churchill quote, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. I don't have any pretense towards being a Winston Churchill type orator, but I would add my own pithy comment to that by mentioning that the defendant found guilty in a criminal case of murder takes small comfort from the fact that his lawyer didn't charge him much. There is much to say. There is much to say about primary elections and the policy underlying primary elections. There are open primaries, closed primaries, blanket primaries, California Democrat Party versus Jones, and on and on and on. And we, we could have some good discussion and debate about. But we can't get to that point because of the way this bill is drafted. And once again, as I read it, it's a, it would create a free-for-all at the general election. An interesting idea that I would like to weigh in on as far as policy is concerned, but right now I think the nuts and bolts aspect are such that we can't advance that far. Let me use one more analogy here, uh, Senator St. Augustine. Potentially a really good cake, but I think you took it out of the oven a little too soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Klitschke. <clears throat> Mr. Cruz. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Victor Cruz and I'm the chairman of the Republican Party of Guam. I want to take this opportunity to testify on Bill 45-34. I'd like to begin by thanking Senator St. Augustine for the intent of his bill. It's always, it always looks good for, to find ways to save money and make the government more efficient. After reviewing the bill with the Republican Party officials, I am here on behalf of the Republican Party of Guam to testify against Bill 
that's 34. The parties share similar concern that have been uh, voiced in the past by the uh, chair chairman of the Democratic Party, as well as the Guam Election Commission. We believe this bill have, will have opposite effect of its intent. It will increase costs of the election process while making future election inefficient. In the upcoming gubernatorial election, there are potentially four to five teams running for office. Should Bill 45 pass into law, none of the four teams will be able to achieve the 50 plus one. This will trigger a runoff election, which will actually be more costly than leaving the current uh, law in place. In addition to this increase, the Guam Election will, uh, Commission would have to scramble to put together a special election, which would make it possible, I mean, which would make the proposed law less efficient. In closing, I would like again to thank and commend the author of this bill. However, the Republican Party is against the measure because of serious concern outlined above. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Paris. First of all, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address on this particular measure, to address this body. Um, the intent, let me just read this thing. By way of introduction, my name is Joaquin P. Paris. I am a resident of the village of Santa Rita and a registered Guam voter. I am here with submitting this testimony on Bill 4534 relative to the repeal of all references and language regarding primary elections from the Guam election laws, specifically Title III Guam Code annotated. I have voted in every Guam primary and general election since 1964. I come before you to voice concern over the provisions of Bill number 4534. Um, I should note that I did, I did not say I'm against, and I, I, I only said I was in favor of, or I'm against the bill because there's no column for in between. I like the intent of the bill. I really do. As Mr. Cruz has stated, we have already talked about calling or designing a, some legislation, if you will, for a closed primary controlled by the parties. And uh, our, only, our only problem now is figuring out where both parties are gonna get that kind of money. But um, because, and I maybe suggest this to the legislature for all the other committees, to put a column there that's neither for or against. Because there are some, some people that would like to testify on the general intent of the bill. Um, my testimony reflects my personal beliefs only and do not represent an official statement or position of the Democratic Party of Guam, of which I am a member, or the Guam Election Commission. As I read this measure, I gathered that the singular intent is the elimination of the primary election as a means of reducing or eliminating costs now borne by GovGuam. Since the primary election of 2016 eliminated only two candidates, from each party, it seems that a lot of money is being spent on a process that seems frivolous and only marginally beneficial. Perhaps this may apply to this legislative race because only a plurality is required to win placement on the general election ballot. The 15 highest vote getters are declared elected and move on to the general election, where again, only the 15 highest voters, vote getters earn the title senator. In the 2016 primary election, there were 17 candidates for each party. By enactment, Bill 4534 would eliminate the primary election simply by deleting any reference to any primary election the government code, in the government code annotated. By eliminating any reference to a primary election, it must be assumed that all candidates upon successful completion of required candidacy qualifications will be placed on the general election ballot. This references back Senator Klitschke's uh, reference to this thing being a free-for-all. In the legislative race, elimination of the primary election may be doable because winning a legislative seat is based on plurality. The top 15 candidates would be declared winners, provided that the margin between the 15th and 16th positions is greater than 2%. The law now provides that if margin is within 2%, a recount will be conducted. In such a case, there can be no certification of any results of the election until the matter is resolved. Um, 
as Democrats, we all saw that we could not call caucus for a good 21 days because we could not certify. The Election Commission could not certify. If the Election Commission cannot certify, then there's a question of whether you can have a runoff. And the law now reads that your runoff has to be done within 14 days. So that situation has to be addressed. That provision of the law has to be addressed. Greater concern and thought has to be placed on the gubernatorial and delegate to Congress races, as each of these races requires securing a majority of 50% plus one of the ballots class cast, including absentee provisional and challenge ballots. Elimination of the primary election in the case of these two offices could frustrate and delay even further the certification of election results. The 2016 elections provide insight into this matter. In the 2016 congressional election, there were four candidates placed on the ballot for the primary. Under the proposals contained in Bill 4534, if there is no primary election, Delegate Madeline, if there was no primary election, Delegate Madeline Zeebordalio and candidate Anthony Mavalta for the Democratic Party, and former Governor Felix Camacho and candidate Margaret Metcalf for the Republican Party, party would all be listed on the general election ballot. At the end of the 2016 primary, Congresswoman Berdalio garnered 33.25% of the votes. Mr. Rabalta received 19.45, former Governor Camacho received 19.19, and Ms. Metcalf received 12.55. No one received the required 50% plus one. So you'd have to have a runoff. What's not weird, but a little bit strange about this thing is that the runoff would have been between Madeline Berdalio and Tony Bavalta because were the, those were the two highest vote getters. So the runoff would have been between the two Democrats, there would be no re Republicans represented in that runoff election. Other issues have to be considered. Because of federal laws governing elections, specifically provisions for sending, receiving, and counting absentee ballots, and some of you are, or most of you are, uh, know about the Yukawa laws, uh, and particularly to protect voters in the military. If the provisions of Bill 4534 had been in place, the runoff election would have been held in December. My estimate is that it would have been held in late December. The law requires that if this was a gubernatorial election, that the governor would be inaugurated on the first Monday of January. And that would have been a little bit difficult. Number one, you would not have given that new governor any transition time. And he would be going in literally blind. I, you know, I call back your attention to the, to the fact that we couldn't, the Democrats could not have their caucus until almost December. And it was, there was difficulties. We, we saw it. Absentee voters, who cast votes in the initial election must be permitted to vote in any subsequent runoff and the absentee voting process will be replayed. Any decision to disregard or dismiss absentee voting in runoff elections may result in the disenfranchisement of qualified voters, specifically and more dangerously, voters who are in the uniform services stationed off island. God forbid that we ever disenfranchise voters deployed to conflict zones. More importantly, would anyone in this body suggest these, that absentee voting not be permitted in a runoff election? If that's the case, if that's the desire of this body, then you have to change the law again because the runoff, uh, there is a mandate for a runoff election. For the 2018 gubernatorial elections, four candidates have already filed organizational reports with the Guam Election Commission. I think it is safe to assume that these, fours will, these four will have their names placed on the ballot. There's also the possibility that an additional two candidates will file for the same position. There's all kinds of rumors out there, and we've heard them all. It's still early in the game. With a potential for six teams running for a single office, what are the odds that any one team will garner 50% plus one on November 6, 2018? The history of Guam elections say otherwise. I was around when they had the, the election for the first and second gubernatorial elections, 
And because there was more than two candidates, one from each party, a runoff had to be, had to, had to be held. And that not only, it's, it delays the process, it doesn't, it cuts into the time for the transition, and it really doesn't do any good for, to settle the people down after an election. Elections are very heated on Guam, they're very passionate. It would be nice if after the election, during the Thanksgiving and Christmas season, everybody could calm down and take a look at what has to be done in the coming year. In any case, whether it's, it be for the gubernatorial office or the congressional seat, a runoff election, if required, would entail cost over and above the cost of the general election itself. You don't, if you have to have a runoff, you're going to assume the same, basically the same cost as you did if you held a primary. You're going to have the same number of precinct officials. You're going to have to run the same number of ballots. And if you, if you hold it on, on, a, on a weekday, which is probably the, if you're going to follow the, the election laws, um, your turnout might, be, might not be as good. If you held it on a Saturday, the turnout might be better. But then the people that you work on that Saturday, particularly the GovGuam employees, you'd have to pay double time. Other matters complicate the first process even further. There are issues with absentee ballots. The counting of absentee ballots as well as provisional and challenge ballots are not accomplished immediately after the close of the polls. Thus, the certification and election results are automatically delayed, in some cases for days, until the issues surrounding these ballots and their handling are resolved. The potential date for runoff elections will have to be considered in light of legal requirements for the handling of these absentee ballots. Right now, the law reads 14 days. Because we cannot even begin to count absentee ballots until 10 days after the polls close, you're already, you've only got four days, room for four days. You won't hold a provisional or a runoff election in, the, in that four-day time span. If the ballot count falls within 2% over oh, the potential for runoff, the potential date for runoff elections will have to be considered in light of legal requirements for the handling of absentee ballots. Existing provisions for runoff elections may be challengeable in light of federal statute enacted to prevent disenfranchisement of absentee voters, particularly voters in the military service who are deployed or stationed out of country. If the ballot count falls within 2% between two candidates for the last two positions, and this is, even though this refers to the, um, refers to the, to the legislative races, uh, what do you do if you have a gubernatorial election where the ballot count falls within 2%? You're gonna have to recount the whole mess. And that is not, that is not an easy task. This occurred in, for the legislative race that occurred in the 2016 election, which delayed the certification result for nearly three weeks. Because the 15th and 16th positions for the legislative race were separated by less than 2% of the votes, the election commissions could not certify the results. And in reference to the legislature, because they could not certify, we could not have the caucus. Let me bring up one other point. How do you determine the majority? If, if everybody, it was suggested earlier that the thing is gonna be a free for all, then why even have party? Then why even have party? And if you don't have party and it's a free for all, how do you determine the majority? The part of the reason for identification of parties is to determine who, which party would be the majority. An interesting point we were discussing a while back with um, in the election, within the election commission, is if you have a lot of people, something happens and, and you have a lot of people that run independent, they don't want to de declare parties, what do you do? Particularly when you only have 15 seats in this legislature. There's, all I'm saying is that a lot of thought has to be put into this thing. The intent of Bill 4534 to reduce costs to the government is commendable. 
I believe that any effort to reduce, reduce the cost of government is commendable. However, in regards to the election process, which is the funda fundamental basis of our systems of government and democracy, all facets of the election process, including potential legal nuances from beginning to end, should be analyzed statutorily provided for before the first ballot, whether it be for a primary or general election, is even printed. We have 49,000 registered voters. We have to assume, the Election Commission has to assume that every single one of those people are gonna vote. And our rules require that we print 10% over the, that number in the number of ballots. And that's just to provide for spoil ballots or other, other situations. You're gonna have to do the same thing for runoffs, for any, anything that you have to redo the election. That becomes even more expensive. I would recommend that before finalization of this proposal, more discussions in greater detail be conducted with the Guam Election Commission. And you know, we have some very smart young people over at that election commission, not the commissioners, the, day, the staff. Very smart who know the election laws. And discuss it with them and possibly the, possibly the two political parties. Um, right now I'm the chair of the Democratic Party, but that's not gonna be for very long. Other par and other individuals who are interested or groups who may have concerns over implications of this legislature on any Guam election. Statutes governing elections should be very deliberately thought out, designed, discussed, and intensely debated to ensure that every possible scenario is thoroughly covered even before ballots are printed. In my opinion, everyone who has been, who has even a passing interest in the election process should have the opportunity to weigh in on such discussions. Simply to ensure, not necessarily the most economical, but the most efficient and effective system which will produce the most accurate and quickest results. And more importantly, will ensure that every qualified and eligible voter has the opportunity to cast a ballot and have it counted. Um, thank you for permitting the time to express my concerns. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments for this panel? Vice Speaker Terlai. Thank you. Would um, either any of you, what would be your um, opinion if if part of the uh, primary was eliminated, not not all of it, not, like not for all races. I'm, I need to confirm when the election commission testifies if there would be any savings. Let's assume there is a savings by eliminating legislature's primary, AG's primary, OPA primary. But uh, to keep a primary for congressional and gubernatorial, um, if there's a cost savings, does that, um, how would you feel about that? I don't know that you're gonna realize any savings because number one, you'll probably hold it on the same date. You're gonna need the same number of precinct officials. We're still gonna have 70, 77 polling areas. And right now, we used to pay the election officials $75 and, and for, the, for the entire thing. And when we were hand counting, sometimes it would go four days. So I don't know that there would be savings by, really by ballot, splitting the election. As far as ballots are maybe, concerned. Well, well, how would you feel about a, a nonpartisan primary for gubernatorial and congressional candidates? If you're going to have a nonpartisan primary, then why even call for parties? Pardon? If, you, if, you, if, well, if the much, primaries are going to be are going to be nonpartisan, then why have parties? Well, no, all? it would be, yeah, to allow the runoffs earlier if, the, if that was necessary, and yeah. yeah. Vice Speaker, that's a very good possibility, but the thing is, it's not discussed and it's not contained yeah. in this right. particular bill. Okay, yes, Senator. There has to be a lot of research on that. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Madam Vice Speaker, a lot of you younger folks wouldn't remember this, but 
we didn't ha we didn't have primary elections until 1970. Before that, parties uh, parties had caucuses, conventions. Democrats had some kind of a straw poll, etc. Uh, perhaps that would be cheaper, but there are all kinds of ways to save money. We could flip coins. We we could draw straws. Uh, we could we could let it all turn on who's the tallest. That'd be a good way to do it. But I don't think that when we're examining the key feature of our democracy, cost ought to be the primary consideration. Now, I'm as mosquito as anybody else when it comes to government funds, but that can't be the driving force. So if we want to cut costs as far as elections are concerned, whether it's a primary election or a general election, then the way to do it is to focus on cutting costs not complicating uh, the process by attempting to do a partial surgery and removing one of the key organs of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the beast, so to speak. And I could think of a lot of different ways of cutting costs. Uh, in the at the end of the 28th Guam Legislature, an election reform bill passed the legislature and was sent to the governor. The governor pocket vetoed it, and if anyone were to go back into the archives and dig that out, there are innumerable ways of saving money, cutting costs, however you want to do it. But uh, before we start, before we start um, tinkering with the essential function of our whole dem democratic system. I think we need to know why we're doing it. If we, if we are doing it because we are attempting to find a better process, a fairer process, a more representative process, a more honest process, however, however you want to phrase it, that's one thing. But if we're only looking at saving money, um, I'll be back here again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Yes, I, I just wanted to clarify because we have the party uh, heads here. Yeah, whether how much of this of their testimony has partisan um, concerns, also timing concerns, also money. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of feel out what what is the primary concern. But yeah, Mr. Cruz, please. Well, like I said earlier, I commend the uh, the uh, Senator San Augustine for f trying to find a way to. Uh, uh, be more efficient and save money. But one way that uh, I, as a chairman, have discussed with other party officials within us is that why, do no, why don't we just go ahead and have a closed primary? Let the uh, Democrats choose their primary the way they want to do it on their date and let the Republicans do the primary on, on the date that we set and have it there. That will basically cu uh, cut not the total cost, but it will cut costs because we will still need the Guam Election Commission to, to basically certify how we run our primaries and how who are the winners are, based whether everything is on, on a fair game. That's one way that I would say would cut the cost and everything. And as um, Mr. Um, Democrat here said, running it all at one time, you know, in the end, people would still have to either run as a Republican as a Democrat, or as an independent. And that's basically, you know, and also to include the gubernatorial, because, hey, is it a Republican administration or is it a, Repu uh, a Democrat administration? That's how I feel it should be done. All of you, most of you, everybody up there except one is a Democrat. And you all ran under that particular banner because you believed in the precepts and, and the beliefs of the Democratic Party. And you were, able, you were able to garner the majority. And that's, that majority carries with it certain responsibilities. But all of you are pledged to one thing, and that's to work for the people not to work for the Democrats, not to work for the Republicans. You're pledged to work for the people. 
if you can do that, or you have to do that as a Democrat, you have to do that as a Republican. If you don't, you're going to lose the next election. That's the bottom line. If you're clearly, clearly partisan when you're, when you're doing your job in here, I don't think you're going to last very long. We've seen it. The average number of terms that this legislative body experiences is about two and a half. The, not the average, I'm sorry, the, the, the quickest number of people. Some, some people have served only one term and they're gone because the people make that choice. My concern is that when, one of my concerns is that when you conduct this free-for-all election, how do you determine, number one, the party leadership or the leadership in the legislature? Never mind the party leadership. The parties take care of that. The, the, the leadership in the, in the legislature. How do you determine the committees? How do you determine the standing rules? This is, I think, even though that's basically a partisan, uh, it, it borders on partisanship, it has to be discussed. You know, and I, I don't know. And if you, if you make this thing a free for all, we're 20, 20 Republicans can run, 20 Democrats can run, 20, 20 uh, independents can run. I don't want to be with the party anymore because that's going to, in my opinion, that's going to be a holy mess. What are you going to do if you have five Democrats win, five Republicans win, and five independents? How do you, how do you work the situation in the legislature itself? So, I like the idea of giving it to the party. Victor and I have talked about closed primaries, giving the primaries back to the party. We're going to need the help of the government because there's no way you're going to, particularly the Democrats, they got money. Democrats don't have money. <laughs> We're the poor people, the grassroots. And let the, let the parties do it. You know, I was around when they had the last caucus the last convention. It was held down at the, at the Guam Rec Center, down by Adaloop, and several of us were forcibly removed from that caucus because we started raising hell. And somebody was right, was here that was saying that it was the party bosses. That maybe have been one of the reasons to call for a primary, to let the government run the primary. But I think most of all, it was a call because there was a lot of dissatisfaction when the party bosses were choosing the candidates. Maybe that were, they weren't the best candidates to go on the ballot. And so there was a movement. Um, your daddy was there in the, 68, uh, in the 68 caucus convention. And your grandfather and his daddy. So there's history. Those who are preparing this bill, study that history and see if you can improve on what happened there to make a better system. If there's, if there's flaws in this system, then fix it. But don't just do away with it without looking at all the other nuances and all the other possibilities. Because 2018 election is going to be a very complicated election. You don't have to take my word for that as, as, as a member of the party. Take it from the election commission. You have, you have already three Democrats candidates that have filed their organizational report. There's two more in the wings. You have one Republican candidate that has filed his organizational report. And I hear there's one more in the wings. That's a total of seven candidates. Tell me that there's not going to be a runoff. There will be a runoff. And the same thing with, I already know three people that are gonna run for the congressional seat. They're gonna, you're gonna have another problem there. Maybe not the legislature, but think of the others, the other officers. Thank you. Any other questions for the panel? If none, and gentlemen, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Also. We will go ahead and conclude the uh, hearing on Bill 45-34, but the committee will be able to continue to receive some uh, written testimony if you so desire to send us to nicholas at gmail.com.
If anybody wishes to provide any kind of clarification or counterpoints to the positions that were stated here today, those will also be welcome for the committee report. Just to clarify, the Election Commission did not sign up to testify for Bill 45? I'm sorry, one moment, please. I do not have any indications, but please um, join us and, and provide your testimony. Ms. Pengelin, go ahead and proceed at any time on Bill 45. Um, I think it's good afternoon already, or almost good afternoon. Sidzus Masi, for letting us appear before you. I come before you with pertinent information on Bill 4534. Um, the estimated cost of a primary election based on historical cost and based, most um, based on 2016 primary election is $447,000. The Guam Election Commission respectfully notes that the money saved by removing the primary election may be offset by the cost of a runoff election, which would likely be necessary for the gubernatorial and congressional races which require a majority vote pursuant to the Organic Act of Guam. Conducting a runoff election is costly. Ballots must be printed, absentee ballots must be packaged and mailed to Uokava absentee voters, election officials must be hired, and overtime costs are higher due to time constraints relative to conducting an election in such a short period of time, namely 14 days. The commission notes, also notes that the method by which qualified individuals would be nominated to appear on the general election on ballot is unclear. 3GCA section 15104 states, a partisan candidate for office shall be nominated in accordance with, chap with this chapter and not otherwise except as provided by law. This section is being repealed. As it is written, 4534 seeks to repeal Chapter 15 of Title III of the Guam Code Annotated, but offers no alternative to the processes it seeks to repeal. Um, Senator Joseph Augustine, the sponsor of the bill, um, has, has taken a look at that already. The Commission also notes that 1 GCA, Section 1903 and 9, 1903E and F, mandate that all qualified candidates for public auditor shall be placed on a separate ballot for the Office of Public Ac Accountability and cast in the primary election. This is still in the books. Similarly, also for the Attorney General, this is still in the books, even with the passage of, even with the, uh, pa it, in the case of the passage of this law. Please note also that the Commission applies 3 GCA 15202. All the notices, um, we apply that to the general election, and so this too is going to be repealed if, the, if this bill is passed. There are additional sections in 3 GCA um, that outside of Chapter 15, that will still be in the law that need to be addressed. And those are listed in, my, in the written comments of the Guam Election Commission. Um, lastly, and, and a great assurance is the Guam Election Commission is ministerial in nature and is committed to administering fair and open elections as mandated by law and is also committed to adapting its processes as laws are enacted. Sidzus Masi. Thank you, Ms. Pangolinen. Does the sponsor have any questions for Ms. Pangolinen? 
No, uh, thank you, Ms. Penglin. Um, I have a copy of your letter. We're looking at that, and I've, I've already advised the, uh, the chairman that uh, we will be adding that back on. Didn't realize that when we eliminated that section, it took away everything to be even a candidate. And um, well, I'll be addressing that, and it's like I asked the uh, chairman that we may consider another hearing to address the other concerns I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanagasin. Just to clarify, Ms. Pangolini, you signed up on the, on the uh, Bill 111 sheet. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, no problem. We'll make sure that it's properly reflected. Okay. Um, I did have a, a, a few questions. My first was, um, on average, how many spoiled ballots do we have in a, uh, in a primary election? Okay. You know, since I started, I was really, um, I don't have the exact figures, but we've gone down by a lot. Um, at one point, I was counting like 5,000. Uh, in 2012, I believe, and we can get you the information. We'll provide you the update, but it's gone down by quite a bit. Uh, I think in 16, it was closer to 2000 in the primary. Um, and so, uh, in just roughly in 2016, how many total votes were cast? Uh, in the primary, um, 49, 49%, mm, uh, so that's about, um, uh, I believe 39,000. Oh, I have it here. Sorry, um, I ha we ha we have that information, sir. I'll get it for you. Sure. Um. Twenty-four thousand, sir. Twenty-four thousand two hundred, which is forty-nine percent of total registered voters. So we spent four hundred and forty-seven thousand for twenty-four thousand two hundred votes cast, inclusive of the spoiled ballots? Yes. Oh, no. The, the, the um, 49,000 is um, the ballot. 20, yeah. The 24,000 is not including not, the no, spoiled. No. So I'm going to add that in. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get an average cost per, um, per ballot cast. Oh, it comes to, oh, for the primary election, I didn't figure that out. But, the na uh, but Guam falls a lot before the national average for ballots, ca for the cost of ballots cast right so just and these are all just estimates but right. based on a 2000 spoil ballot added back to a 24200 actual ballot that was counted we have 26200 votes that were cast in the 2016 primary at a cost of $447,000 which means we spent about $17.06 per per ballot total and so multiply that by the 2000 spoil ballots and um, we lost $34,000 to um, crossover votes. And the reason I'm asking is because one of the things that were discussed was what if we just opened up the primaries that people can cross over and so that we're not wasting the money on these ballots, on okay. these particular votes. And I wanted to note too that in the preparation of the primary election, we're also preparing for the general election. Part of the cost that's, um, part of the cost of the 447,000 is also the um, order of ballot stock. Because it's so much more cost efficient to order it at one time, that's, so I'll, some of the 447 is part of the preparation for the general. I see, okay. Any of my colleagues have any other questions for Ms. Penguina? No? Ma'am, thank you so much for the information. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we will now go ahead and conclude the hearing on Bill 45 and we'll continue to receive testimony in written form at um, senatorsnicholas at gmail.com. Uh, I appreciate um, the author's patience on Bill 111-34 and, uh, and I'll yield to Senator Adda for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in a previous legislature, um, the legislation was introduced to um, create the Guam Solid Waste Authority in anticipation of the eventual turnover of the solid waste operations uh, back to Gulf Guam from the receiver. Um, and of course, uh, anticipating that returning back uh, to the Department of Public Works uh, days certainly would not be an acceptable um, um, uh, way to go. So the Guam Solid Waste Authority was created. The turnover of the um, receivership uh, appears that it may happen in December of 2017. So what Bill 111 uh, proposes, provides then, is it provides that bridge 
uh, to enable the uh, turnover from the receiver to the uh, Guam Solid Waste Authority. Uh, and the formulation of this bill, of course, was, uh, was done in, in close collaboration with the Guam Solid Waste Authority. Uh, but, and, and it was done so mostly primarily because um, I, as the sponsor of this bill, was also the sponsor of the bill that created the, uh, the, the uh, Guam Solid Waste Authority uh, legislation itself. So there was that, it, there was some continuity. So um, uh, I think with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, the chair, I know the chairman of the uh, Solid Waste Authority is here and um, he probably would uh, be best to go ahead and elaborate then on um, this, the bridges that uh, Bill 111 provides. Thank you, Senator Ada. We do have some individuals who have signed up all in favor of the measure. We only have one individual who indicated that they would like to provide testimony on the measure today. Ms. Miller, to clarify, will you be providing testimony as well or are you just as an observer? No, no testimony? Okay. So we only have Mr. Andrew Gale, sir, if you can please join us. I need to change the first word of my speech here because it says Menana Sidzuus. But now it's buenas and half a day. <laughs> um, so my name is Andrew Gale. I am the current, the current chairman of the, of the Guam Solid Waste Authority. I'd like to thank Senator Ada for the, uh, the introduction of the, the reason for this particular bill and for working with me and the Solid Waste Authority Board on the language of this bill. Uh, as he said, Senator, uh, Senator Ada was the primary author of the Enabling Act of the Guam Solid Waste Authority, and we appreciated his help with this bill to transition the Guam Solid Waste Authority out of receivership. I uh, would also like to acknowledge uh, Senator Nelson for her initial feedback regarding this bill as well, although she's not here. So as you know, the Division of Solid Waste Management of the Department of Public Works was put into federal receivership several years ago. Um, in order to transition out of receivership, uh, GovGuam has to demonstrate to the court that it has the managerial, technical, and financial wherewithal to operate a municipal solid waste uh, management system in compliance with all federal and local regulations and adhere to the consent decree that was signed years ago as a result of the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, suing GovGuam to close the ORDOT dump. Uh, to that end, the Guam Solid Waste Authority was created. However, the enabling legislation was crafted after receivership uh, began and specific issues have arisen out of receivership that we would like to address with your help. We have proposed some, some updates to that legislation and others based on working with the aforementioned senators, the U.S. District Court, the receiver, and the Attorney General's office, as, as well as the, the Governor's office. Uh, this bill does important things, which I will highlight now. Uh, one, it, it clarifies employment rules and ensures that the Guam Solid Waste Authority is aligned with GovGuam and other autonomous GovGuam agencies. Um, it addresses some specific issues regarding the transition of operations and employees to the Guam Solid Waste Authority, as well as contracts that are currently in place that are critical to the operation of the authority. Uh, it directs the PUC to conduct a management audit of the agency. Um, it affirms the current residential and commercial rates that were proposed and implemented by the receiver and approved by the courts. It also mandates a rate review post-receivership as well as uh, various um, stipulations upon the implementation of any rate changes. Uh, it mandates the acquisition of existing systems, employees, and debt from the receiver. It asserts civil service jurisdiction for classified employees of the Guam Solid Waste Authority. And it establishes procurement authority uh, for the Guam Solid Waste Authority. The current timeline adopted by the court calls for the transition of control of the Guam Solid Waste Authority from the federal receiver to the GSWA board uh, by the end of the year, 
or beginning of January, January 2018. This bill helps ensure that the operations of the Guam Solid Waste Authority are not impacted by this transition and that the high current standard of trap service is maintained for residential, commercial, and government customers. Um, as a brief update, we are pleased to inform you that we have interviewed several qualified candidates for the G general manager position and are in the process of hiring our top selection. We hope to have uh, uh, him on board by the beginning of September and this position, this uh, general manager, will play a key role in the transition of the board, uh, and the, excuse me, in the transition of the agency. And the board is confident that we will have the team in place to facilitate that transition with the cooperation of the receiver. Again, thank you for your time and your consideration of this bill. On behalf of the board, we do feel that this bill uh, will indeed facilitate our transition out of federal receivership and allow, and allow GovGuam to resume control of its municipal solid waste system. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Um, does the uh, sponsor have any questions for the individual? Any of my fellow, fellow colleagues have any questions? Vice just, Speaker just, Yeah. Um, I know probably every agency wants this, but the government doesn't allow every agency to control its own procurement. So could you just justify why GSWA should control its own procurement as opposed to um, using the same mechanism that the rest of the agencies are doing? Well, the enabling legislation called on, a, called on the Solid Waste Authority to be an autonomous agency. Other autonomous agencies are in control of their own procurement. Uh, there are some um, issues, I think the, uh, the Attorney General uh, will probably issue some written testimony regarding that specific clause, uh, particularly in regards to construction. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the mandates, uh, one of the requirements of uh, the Guam Solid Waste Authority going forward will be to open new cells. And uh, so one of the things we'll have to address is how we will handle the construction of such new cells in Ladzon. Uh, and so uh, that is uh, one of the primary reasons uh, is that uh, is, is those specific types of requirements uh, for procurement uh, are, um, are uh, which are currently being handled by the receiver and not being handled by uh, any other GovGuam agency. Uh, the idea was we would maintain that in order to, again, uh, meet the requirements set forth by the court to transition from receivership to um, GovGuam control. One of the other um, items that the court insisted upon was that uh, GSWA um, update its agency's rules and regulations. Has That's that correct. been done already? In, in the process of that, the, um, um, the, the board adopted its own rules and regulations, but that really just governed how the board operated. The agency's operational rules and regulations have been um, are, are being reviewed, uh, excuse me, they were established really when the receiver took over control, they had to have some form of operational procedures. And so, so those are uh, being um, uh, worked on by the current uh, operations manager of the receiver. And we hope to have our uh, general manager on board again in September. They will help and that will refine those, um, um, refine those uh, operations in order to make sure that again, we're in compliance with the consent degree and with uh, all the requirements that the, uh, the court has placed on this uh, GovGuam to come out of receivership. The, yeah, the court also re um, requires the agency to review its rates, have its right. rates reviewed, but yeah, so the bill is suggesting or mandating that that be done within 180 days from the date the receiver terminates and right. I'm guessing this review is going to bring the rates up. Is there any way you foresee avoiding raising the rates? I mean, it's, well, it's unfortunate that the receiver wasn't required to review the rates. I mean, I mean, they, they were in the beginning, but so now you're going to be left with increasing the rates? Is that well, what we should expect? Well, for the, for the sake of, of clarity, um, I, I'll, I'll just say that the receivers has presented in court that they have done a full rate review and that the current rates that are being charged are sufficient for the current and future operations of the Solid Waste Authority. Um, now, there has been arguments uh, that um, 
this does not include other obligations that the authority may have, which would include debt service. Uh, the, the debt service is something that will have to be factored in and decided upon as a, as a government and as a, as a people, we need to decide, you know, that debt service has to be paid. It's currently being paid, you know, right from the, right off the top of the Section 30 funds, and that's the way the, that's the way the, the bond was written. Um, the, uh, there was a, an agreement for the solid waste, the, the receivership at the time, uh, to contribute uh, to some form of uh, recompensation of, to the general fund of those Section 30 funds. Uh, but the receiver has made an argument in court that um, there are unfunded consent decree projects that require that, that money. And so, so that's, still, that's still an issue. Um, the, the primary reason for us to put that particular language in this bill was to ensure that there were legally bona fide rates in place at the point of transition from receivership to uh, back to GovGuam control. Uh, there are some arguments that have been made that the rates that are in place today were uh, proposed and established by the court, not by the normal method of a utility for setting a rate. Thus, we, we, this, this legislation allows us to say, look, we're going to adopt the rates, and then we're going to take a look at the rates. And then we're going to do our full rate study with our management team, uh, pulling all together all the stakeholders of the government that are associated, that are involved in the debt associated with the you know, municipal landfill and then decide, you know, do, do we want to have the rate payers, uh, the, the Solid Waste Authority and its rate payers pay that debt service? And if so, this is what the rates will have to come to. If not, then the rates can be something different. But, but what this legislation does, again, is it allows us to adopt those rates formally and legally so that if someone were to come and say, hey, those aren't legal rates, I'm not going to pay them. We've got, we've got an avenue for that. And then it mandates us, you know, look, you've got to look at the rates. And, and we worked with uh, Senator Adam, and we thought what a fair timeline would be was, look, give us six months. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gip. My concern is that, yeah, whether this bill uh, setting this kind of timeline or just mandating a rate study, you know, those are very costly and that we are going to pretty much ensure our rates go up by, by requiring these things. And I was going to ask you also, this, the transfer of employees or, or the ability to take on the contracts that are currently under the receiver, do you foresee any of those increasing the no. rates? I mean, I can understand no. the debt, but uh, no. if, if all things remain the same, including the debt that the the agency's not covering the debt. Do you foresee anything in this bill that's going to um, increase the cost to the agency? Uh, you know, Senator, I do not. I, I um, the, the, you know, there are there are two major two major contracts that the Solid Waste Authority um, has right now, and that is the uh, the operation of the Lads and Landfill. And we we're, and those are multi-year contracts, and and we we're working with the uh, the, the board has just met with the uh, current um, operators of that contract and talked about decreasing costs in the future, and as well as the haulers only transfer station. And again, we don't anticipate those uh, uh, those costs increasing. Uh, we uh, we are still we are hopeful that as we migrate from as we transition from receivership into GovCon control, there will be some savings, cost savings in terms of, of, of the management of, the, um, of the, um, the Solid Waste Authority itself. That, that has still yet to be seen. We have an opinion that we think it might be lower. The, the, uh, the receiver has expressed that there are certain uh, costs that have to be factored in when you bring in your own management. So, so, so we, we think that if at the best, maybe may, may it might be a wash. Um, we do our, we, we realize our mandate uh, as, a gov as a government agency to have, you know, um, 
you know, our employees fall under, you know, specific, you know, specific uh, rules and regulations. So, so this will help us move, move those in. So, but to end, back to your question, I'm sorry for going around in a circle, but I, I don't think those will materially impact the rates uh, one way or the other. Again, just based on, uh, on, on our, our view of uh, the existing rate models that the receiver has done. Uh, the, the real question really gets back to uh, the debt service and the obligations. The obligations of the, um, of the solid waste authority going forward uh, in order to uh, meet the requirements set forth by the U.S. District Court. And, and there are extensive requirements. There's, there's a, uh, currently there's, there's a, um, there's going to be a trustee that will have to be established that will accept all of the revenues of the uh, Solid Waste Authority, and that trustee will then distribute funds to the Solid Waste Authority based on a, uh, on a, a set of rules established by the court. Uh, so that's the current way that the, uh, the court has established of, of coming out of receivership. So there's going to be certain, still certain controls that are replaced on the revenues uh, developed by the Solid Waste Authority. Thank you very much. Okay. Senator Torres. Mr. Gale, how many employees were affected by the administrative transfer to the receiver? Um, I have the, uh, I have, sorry, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I have the um, staffing pattern. Um, when GovGuam was in receivership, the Division of Solid Waste had approximately 99 employees. Today, there are roughly about 49 employees. So they, the receiver touts um, um, efficiencies uh, and also outsourcing. You know, again, parts of the, uh, parts of the uh, operations of the um, Solid Waste Authority are outsourced from the hauler only transfer station and the lads and landfill. So I, I think there would be about 40 or so. So this, this uh, bill also secures the livelihood of those employees as well. Um, That's the idea. The yeah. idea is we, we want to, main, we want to you know, we, we don't want to miss a beat. The, the receiver definitely knows what they're doing in terms of solid waste management. They put in a, a, a very good system. You can argue all day, you know, about the cost of it, but they put in a, a very good system that is, uh, that has, uh, uh, you know, has 99 point nine percent you know collection ratios it's got on time this you know all sorts of things we, we don't want to change any of that We're, there's no um, as a as, as a member of the board I don't want to go back to uh, uh, uncertain uh, uh, municipal solid waste pickup so we want to ensure that this uh, that there is a seamless transition and we maintain our obligations going forward again that's why we wanted to uh, give ourselves some flexibility as we transition out of receivership into a full GovGuam, back into GovGuam control. And thank you for your testimony because your, your opening actually put into perspective the importance of this bill and, and what it, it was speaking to. So I, I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Torres. I actually have some questions and, and some concerns I'm hoping that we can, we can address. So um, the, the big question is, are, are rates going to go up when we do this transition? And um, the intent is for it not to. But as I read on page 6, um, section 51A121, the acquisition of existing systems, employees, and debt, mm -hmm. uh, I'm particularly concerned with how the language on lines 2 through 4 correlate to the language on lines 9 to 13. Because in lines 2 to 4, it says that no later than 30 days before the effective date of transfer of operational control from the federal receiver to the Guam Solid Waste Authority, the authority shall, shall assume in writing from the federal receiver, the authority, not the government, the authority in particular. Item B, all working capital, cash, accounts payable and receivable, deposits, advances, payable and receivable, all books, records, and maps, and all other rights, obligations, assets, liabilities, agreements, and privileges of the authority or attributable to the authority. The way this reads to me is that any debt that's currently being serviced by the government, once we pass this, 30 days from the transfer, the authority is going to assume 
the responsibility for servicing all of that. And if the cost of servicing the existing debt isn't already priced into the rates, they're going to have to raise the rates in order to service that debt. Am I is my interpretation of that incorrect? Um, I, I don't interpret it the same way you did, and, and uh, when we wrote it, we didn't, we didn't intend it to sound that way, so perhaps we need to clarify that language uh, okay. if, if, if that is how you in, uh, read as a, you know, as a, someone who writes these, these bills. Okay. I appreciate that, that feedback, but that was not the intent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. See, the, the well, way I'm reading right, is that the, the, the authority shall assume in writing, which means it's almost like they're contractually um, obligating themselves to assume those right. responsibilities. You know, the, the, the intent of this particular section was, look, you're operating, you, you've got control of the books, you've got control of the equipment, you've got control of, uh, of the employees. You need to transition it to the solid waste, uh, to the... Uh, to the Guam Solid Waste Authority, as uh, led by the board, and led and the board ha has appointed, uh, you know, um, uh, management that will now um, take over that. Th that was the intent. I think if, I may if we can, also, Senator, thank you. I think if I may, I, on page four, section three, also requires the PUC to conduct uh, to initiate a, a management audit mm -hmm. um, uh, at sixty days at least 60 days from the date of enactment of this act um, and to the maximum extent possible completed uh, before December 30th. Uh, and I would think that my understanding was that this management audit will certainly flag if there's anything that, that might give pause to page six, that paragraph B in the assumption in writing. Yeah, and I, I just, I see like, I, 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 I hear what the sponsor's saying. I just, I see areas where there's almost, where there, there may be some, um, a little too much room for interpretation. Like for example, on, on page four, lines 18 to 22, I see that that section on the surface intends to kind of freeze rates in place, but because it's so specific as to the time and purpose of those rates, it's almost as if a change can happen if it doesn't fit into that narrow definition. So for example, it reads rates and charges for the collection, transportation, disposal, storage, recycling, and processing of solid waste in effect at the time of enactment of this act shall remain in effect and be adopted by the GSWA until the PUC has approved a petition for adjustment of rates. But because we did not include in those line items debt service, then they may be able to adjust rates for the purposes of assuming the debt Without having to, um, without having to be subject to this rate lock, and perhaps even without having to um, have a petition that, uh, a petition approved, because this mandate would have already required them to assume it. It's almost as if it um, it bypasses the mandate to have the rate increase um, discussion in order to assume the debt, because in in, sec in, in um, page six, we're saying that they shall assume it. And in lines 9 through 13, we're specifically saying they're going to assume the liability. And on page 4, lines 18 to 22, we are excluding the cost of that liability from the rate lock. And so by forcing them to assume it and by explicitly excluding it from the, the rate lock, it's as if once the transition happens, they're going to have to bump up rates in order to assume the debt. So I, I think um, I'd like to work with the, the sponsor and, and, and the agency to perhaps tighten the language, because if that wasn't the intent, I, 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 it just looks to me that there may be, um, there may be a, a, a hole that might be interpreted to presume that the law is authorizing the authority to assume that bond and is expi explicitly not prohibiting the rate from increasing with respect to that assumption. So Thank we'll you. Again, page. the intent of that specific section was we actually, when we went to the senator and said we, we're concerned about <clears throat> having bona uh, legally enforceable rates come January 1. And, and so we wanted to say, we wanted to say, look, let's just, and, there, and, as, and as, as far as we've been advised, you know, there are, there are two ways that a, a public utility can set rates. 
One is, one is the legislature can set the rate or the Public Utility Commission can set the rate. And most people, most of the agencies will go to the Public Utility Commission, prepare a rate study, and say this is what the rate has to be, and then the, the, the commissioners can decide along with their, with advice from their administrative law judge. But we had, we had wanted a, uh, again, it was a, a transition to say, just in case there was any, gonna be any legal argument of some, one of our commercial haulers to say, well, that's not a legal rate, we're not gonna pay it. We just wanted there to be no, ambiguity on the rate, but I, I appreciate your, your, uh, your concern there. And again, I was just explaining what the original intent was. All right, okay, so we'll work with the, the sponsor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gil. Uh, Senator, any questions? Thank you so much, sir, for your testimony. All right, thank you very much for your time. We also have um, signed up another individual who is interested in testifying with respect to the nature of Bill 111, Mr. Wayne Ujoa. Would you just like to transmit this as, as written testimony for the record? Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Ujoa. Did you want to um, present orally as well, or all right, please, please join us. Go ahead and push the button on the microphone, and you may begin at any time, Wayne. Alpha day, senators. Um, my name is Wayne Ujoa, and I like uh, to take this time to uh, disclose that I am an uh, employee of the Guam Legislature and that um, my testimony here today is not shared with the views of this legislature or any of the 15 senators. These are the views of my own and those who uh, signed a petition. Okay, so if I may. Um, senators, what started out here uh, with me, bringing me here today is something that's been going on for years uh, since I've, the receiver has taken, taken over. I was employed at a mayor's office when the receiver was uh, coming in. And what had happened there was I was the person giving out the applications to the residents of the village to sign up with this. And I was never one to pay for my own trash. I always hauled my own trash to the local uh, dump and dumped it myself. So in, in doing that and the receiver coming in, there were folks out there who were complaining about um, they don't need a container that big or the price was just, they saw that the rates were gonna go up because it started from 10 or $12 and they saw that the, it's gonna be increasing maybe some people say $70 to $90 that that may be the goal. Um, there are households who do a lot of recycling and are able to use the on-base facilities uh, to do, uh, how do you say, um, effective recycling with cardboards, plastics, glass and Stuff like that, and that's uh, from what I hear from these people who signed the petition. And with that being said, is that they they have come, vocal out to me and found out that I was throwing my own trash and asked because I was taking my my parents' trash and take the word got around that I was doing it, and they said, "Hey, can you take mine because it's only a small bag, and uh, if you can take mine, I'll pay you." So I figured, why not? It's doing a, a neighbor. Uh, a good neighbor policy on the way as a chore. Never intended it for it to be a business. However, the person at the dump noticed that my trash was getting more and more. And I was told that I can't be dumping there and I can't do that. I need to get a business license. So with that being said, I complied. I don't want to be doing anything illegal. Got a business license and started hauling. Then I was told I can't dump there anymore because I'm considered a commercial hauler and I needed to get an EPA permit and that I can't, dump. so I had to cease all operations for a short time and uh, was able to attain that permit to haul and collect trash and dump. However, in my request to dump uh, the trash that I have, and I, I don't have any great big vehicles or overweight vehicles of that nature, or wide vehicles, it's just merely a pickup truck, just your standard pickup truck, nothing, um, outrageous that considers it a heavy equipment. Anyways, in doing so, I was told that I have to dump in Harmon. Now, I don't go around advertising that I'm gonna do the whole island. I'm just trying to take my trash over to the dump that's 15 miles or 15 minute drive or 30 minute drive from where I live in Talapopo over to Malolo. It was explained to me that I'm being denied to dump at the Legion landfill or the Malolo transfer station in Malolo and I have to take it over to um, 
the Harmon Mr. Rubbishman facility. So I complied, and I've been complying with that for over a year now. However, it's cost me more, and I'll even say that, in all fairness, it's come out of my pocket, but I haven't raised the rates on any of the people who subscribe to the service or request for this service that I have in my village. I'm like a regional hauler, just trying to take people's trash on the way and try and do a good, neighbors, good neighbor policy thing. And I think I, I stumbled onto something that solves the problem within the problem. And what it is is people who can't afford or don't accumulate that much trash is solving the problem within their community. And I was forced to get a business license and I was forced to um, comply with all these uh, government regulations which makes me now um, responsible for the people who I haul their track and on a level that uh, is uncomparable. When I dump at the Harmon facility, even the people down there say the same thing. They were odd that I would show up with a pickup truck on this great big scale and ask me, what am I doing here? I, I, I don't fit, I'm odd. I'm like, well, I was told to and this is what I have to do to comply. So, you know, with, with the people that are out there, there are, um, even with the income that we have, we're barely making ends meet or just making ends meet. So I'm not trying to get rich off this program. I'm just trying, I think that it's fair that if I do you a service on the way to the trash container that, you know, you would, I'd be compensated for it. And it wasn't an idea that I had. It was an idea that somebody offered me. So this is what it evolved to today. So with my testimony today, I'm just going to recite the petition here. It says, Half a Day Senators, we are the proud residents of the Eastern, Southeast, Southern, and Southwest villages, Jotnia, Ipan, Talafofo, Malolo, Inarahan, Marisu, Yamadak, Agate, Santa Rita, Route 17, Cross Island Road, Baza Gardens, and Wimward Hills. We are the family and friends and neighbors of Wayne Joe, a sole proprietor of Half a Day Waste Collection, a small business regional residential waste collection hauler. Senators, we, the middle class and low income families and the small family households of these humbly address, humbly address you to enlighten you of the inconveniences which burden and with our burdens and struggles that we are plagued with regarding residential waste collection service and fees such as the high monthly service fees for a weekly residential waste removal without alternatives, meaning one size container. I started out with just collecting bags. Now I was, I'm able to give them a small container that fits their needs. The other thing is one size waste uh, receptacle, which is a 90 size gallon offer, no other option to choose from, such as a smaller receptacle for those single household, small size family household, or families who just don't accumulate a large amount of waste on a weekly basis. Increasing service rates additional service costs, unfair and overlooked abuse government waste removal practices, government rules and policies preventing and complicating residents, neighbors, and communities from working together and resolving our inconveniences, burdens, and struggles with regards to the residential waste removal disposal fair and sensible fees. We are seeking your support in this matter and beseech you to consider honoring our sensible and, desire and our dire requests. Therefore, we, the undersigned, respectfully petition you, the senators of the 34th Guam Legislature, to apply Section 23104A of GSWDRR, allowing half a day waste collection and other residential waste collection haulers from the eastern, southern, western, southeast, and southwest region the opportunity to collect our residential waste trash and dispose it directly at a EPA approved solid waste management permitted facility in accordance with section 23104A of GSWDRR, which is the Malolo and Agate residential waste trash facility or to introduce and or add a legislation to amend current, Current legislation allowing for such community efforts to dispose of our trash at the residential waste transportation or directly at the Legion Landfill Malolo. 
Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Ujoa, um, does the um, chair of the committee. Uh, I also want to thank you for your service of being um, trying to provide, at least on an organized basis, uh, a, re a remedy for those individuals who may be looking for a, a lower cost alternative to trash hauling. Um, and so in light of your testimony, I, I'm very interested in working with the chair and uh, as well as the, the Solid Waste Authority to see if we can evaluate if there's a method by which we can uh, create a, um, a standard that would um, be reasonable for um, more regional uh, or even village-based operators who are looking to just um, provide uh, uh, relief uh, on, a, on a smaller scale to those individuals who are looking to still avail of the, of the civic duty of properly disposing of their, of their waste. Okay, Senator, and just for the record, I want to let you know that I'm in support of Bill 111. Thank you, Mr. Ujoa. We have no other individuals who have signed up to testify with respect to the measure. That will go ahead and conclude the public hearing on Bill 111-34. We can go ahead and receive additional written testimony from um, the public at senatorsnicholas at gmail.com. Senator, did you have any closing statements on, on the bill? Uh, and with that, um, that will exhaust the items that we have on today, today's agenda. We will go ahead and adjourn the committee at 1238 this afternoon. Thank you all very much.